listening to the Fantasy Takeaway Podcast with Murphy Hamilton and Joe Pollock. Proud member of the Full-Time Fantasy Podcast Network. Subscribe, listen, take home the title. What's up, Takeaway Nation? Welcome back for our Week 7 review. Guys, yet again, I tinkered myself into several losses What is your advice on tinkering at the last minute? Do you guys just try to avoid your lineups or is it something you guys struggle with as well? How often has it ever worked for you is the question. Because I don't do it because I went back and looked at all the times that I tinkered and I'm tinkering points out of my lineup, not into them about 90% of the time. I think that's true for most people. You you over tinker and you end up leaving way too much on the bench. Like there's a difference between tinkering and replacing your RB2 with Latavius Murray when Alvin Kamara goes down. Those aren't the same thing. Like Latavius Murray was a good play. The Bears were giving up a ton of points. But if you're sitting there and you're there, nothing has changed. Like what, you already did all your research. Why are you changing? Boom. <laughs> I don't know, man. I guess just uh, just nervousness. I think my biggest worry this week was like, Will Fuller or Marvin Jones? And I was like, oh, let's go with Will Fuller. And I regretted that mm. almost instantly. Honestly, I think it was the right call, though. Like, I wouldn't have done it the other way. I would have had Will Fuller in my lineup and had Marvin Jones going off on the bench, too. I had Will Fuller in two lineups. I had him in three. I as well have him in three. It was just a rough week for Will Fuller owners. Guys, to start the shows out now, I have a new thing I want to do. I want you to fill in the blanks. So for this week... My question is, the Titans are a blank football team. Good defensive? (laughs) Their offense kind of sucks, but like, I think they're just a better team than the teams they're playing. You know, I'm going to say ascending. Really now? I'm going to, and I'm going to, I'm going out on a limb here. I don't love Tannehill. Uh, I'm not a Tannehill apologist or anything like that, but he played on some pretty ugly Dolphins teams and he played okay. He wasn't great. He wasn't even, I wouldn't even go to say he was good or really good, but he was okay. He got the ball to guys like Jarvis Landry who could make plays and did pretty okay doing that. Mariota just couldn't seem to pull the trigger. He waited back there too long. I don't know what his issue is. Tannehill seems to be ready to unload the rock. He's got the ball to Corey Davis already, which looks really good. Oh, it's Corey Davis season. I know, maybe finally. Golly. That would be the best thing ever. I have him on a bunch of rosters just sitting down there at the bottom waiting for him. Yeah, and but here's the thing. He's a he's a really good player. A.J. Brown appears to be a pretty decent player. Jonu Smith looks like a pretty good player now that Delaney's dead. You know, you get all these guys that are pretty good. They're getting healthy on the O-line. Like, they might be ascending at just the right time. I like it. I like it. I don't totally agree. I think they're kind of just okay, but their defense is really good. If they can have an okay offense, that's good enough. Right. Well, and I said ascending. I didn't say they were good. Let's be clear. They're just not doo-doo anymore. I mean, they almost made the playoffs last year. If they're ascending, they're a playoff team. Oh, I just meant ascending over what we've seen from them to this point in the season. Sure. Joe, that was for you. I did that fill in the blank just so you could be excited about Corey Davis. I knew you wanted Uh, I just want Corey Davis to be good. He was my number one receiver coming out in that draft, and he's been totally wasted. And I watch his film, and I'm like, this guy's good. Why doesn't he produce? All right, guys, let's not waste any time. Let's dive into the show. Let's start out with some news. News and notes from across the NFL. First piece of news is the Pat Mahomes injury. On Thursday night, he dislocated his knee. If you were watching the game, you probably saw the clip of them, what looks like popping it back in on the field. It was uh, not pleasant. But, Joe, what does the Pro Football Doc have to say about the timetable for him to come back? He said it's probably a few weeks, three or four weeks is the average for this kind of injury. He said that there would be some, as long as it wasn't torn all the way through, it doesn't need surgery immediately, but it probably will need surgery at some point because there is some stretching of that ligament. I'm not all that concerned about his prospects long-term, but if you're looking at this from a franchise building perspective, you've almost got to think they might send him out there for surgery if the recovery doesn't go very well because he's he's not going to be able to play without a brace this year from what the pro football doc is saying so if the team struggles and he struggles to come back i think that this injury could be a really big deal joe i want to point out something to you if the chiefs lose their biggest offensive weapon with the way that division is going right now the broncos still have a chance I think the Raiders are going to win the division, <laughs> man. Oh, like, God, I'd say that. Honestly, I really think that the Chiefs are still a better football team. 
than these other teams just because Andy Reid can actually make bad quarterbacks good. But it got a lot closer if Pat Mahomes can't play for a while. Well, and there's one thing that was said there. You said dislocated knee. It was actually just a dislocated knee cap. Yeah, dislocated patella, yeah. not dislocated knee. Yeah, let, let's make sure so when people are listening, they, they don't freak out because a dislocated knee would be a significant <laughs> injury. Yeah, a dislocated knee could, could have arterial damage. Yeah. There's almost certainly multiple ligaments that are torn. With a patellar dislocation, it, it's not as big of a deal, but it's still a big deal. Yeah, sure. And it looks like they're talking three weeks. It appears after the initial reviews that, you know, he's going to be back in about three weeks. Doesn't look like there's been any major damage. And uh, we expect to see him back sooner rather than later. The one thing that the pro football doc has been stressing is that this is an injury that comes with elevated risk of re-injury. So it's one of those things that you've got to be worried about for the rest of the season until he has that surgery to repair that stretch ligament. Yeah, and, and if they can eke out a couple more W's with Matt Moore under center, there's no need to rush Mahomes back. You want him for the playoffs. You don't need to rush him back for some meaningless regular season games if they're continuing to win with a backup. All right, next up, the Raiders have traded Garyon Conley to the Houston Texans for a 2020 third-round pick. This is a guy who was a first-round pick for them not, what, a year ago? Two years ago? I can't remember exactly, but still. Uh, do you guys think this is a good move for the Texans or a good move for the Raiders? Maybe both. I don't really know. He hasn't lived up to expectations at all. And he did have some off the field issues from before, like when he was in college. But it, it's hard to say, man. Like, I it, just keep an eye on it because it could make that Texans defense better. I think it's actually a great deal for the Texans. Uh, he was never a scheme fit for the Raiders. The Raiders want to run a lot more zone. And Conley is definitely more of a man press style corner. And he struggles in zone. He doesn't do well enough in open space to cover up receivers coming in and out of his space. So the Texans are going to let him man up a lot more often than the Raiders did. So I really expect him to be a lot more comfortable in this defense. Yeah, it might take a week or two for him to get really acclimated, but uh, I expect to see Gary and Conley as a really productive member of this defense. All right. And finally, Joe, in the script here, you have the dreaded vote of confidence in Dan Quinn. I would assume that's referring to the Arthur blank comment where he says he still supports Dan Quinn. Do you think this actually means anything or is this just coach double speak? Cause I mean, Al Davis supported a million different coaches and they were all fired at the end of the year. If Dan Quinn's not on the hot seat, I wasn't the one that put that in the script. Actually. I think that was Jeff, but Oh, well, Jeff, you suck. Yeah. Sorry, man. I, I didn't label it. I, I didn't think we had to do that. That's my bad. I didn't put my name on the milk. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I've been saying for a few weeks the Falcons are one of those teams to watch because they just keep struggling. And what I saw this week was a team that didn't appear to really be putting in their best effort. They really looked like a team that's all but given up. And they're to the point now where they're one game away from being out. They're done. They, like Playoffs are completely dead. I mean, I'd say they're all but dead right now, but they're completely dead in another week or so. And... uh you get the, the vote of confidence midseason. The trade deadline's coming up. They've already heard Vic Beasley's on the block. You know, we don't know if there's anybody else involved in any sort of would-be fire sale. But, man, I'm telling you, it doesn't look good in Atlanta right now. Side note, Sam Darnold is really channeling his inner Jameis Winston in this game. Eating the W's? <laughs> he stole no, some crab legs? that. No, neither of those <laughs> things. He's just throwing it up into, like, double coverage constantly. It's ridiculous. There's a, a handful of those throws, and I've been watching it passively, obviously, because I've been here talking to you guys. You know, he's really throwing from pressure quite a bit, and I don't know how the Jets have to figure this out, but they got to get him a little bit of protection. They need some check down guys for him. They're going to need, like, some blocking. I don't know. They need something because right now, they're not giving that guy any help. Good job, Adam Gase. Yeah. I've always loved you. He is the absolute worst. <laughs> All right, guys, that does it for news and notes. Let's dive into our cheap date review. Jeff, you didn't win this week. What happened? <laughs> it was so awful. Um, it was bad this week. Um, you know, Darnold's playing now, and he's channeling his inner Jameis Winston, like bad Jameis, not good Jameis. And um, it, it's pretty ugly. So Miles Sanders, 6.2 points. Tevin Coleman, Dante Pettis combined eight points, and they were all from Coleman. I'm going to give you a pass on those guys, though. Like, when we picked this, we didn't know that it was going to be a three-day monsoon with downpour during Yeah, the it still doesn't excuse four out of Dawson Knox. And you really, this whole lineup was bad. It didn't even break 100. One and a half X. Like, this thing was 
bad. I just I'm going to pretend this never happened when we go ahead and line up our our picks for next week. Yeah, you know how I feel. You got half your points from one player. Pretty yeah. Much. yeah. <laughs> I got 28.6 out of DeAndre Hopkins out of 74.4 points. <laughs> this was so bad. But yeah, if I would have known the 49ers Redskins game was going to be a three day monsoon and it was just going to be a slop fest, I would have pulled all of my 49ers and all of my Redskins out of every lineup. I don't generally get too hyped up on weather but I will look for a handful of things. Number one is I don't like a field that resembles a lake. Two, I don't like winds north of 20 miles an hour. And I certainly don't love any of those winds plus precipitation. We had all of those things in Washington. Check, check, check. Yep. So I certainly would have sat those guys, but I did in fact play a little bit of Coleman just because, well, I needed them to squeeze some other monsters into my lineup. On the bright side for your Niners, at least when you win and you want to celebrate, you have a ready-made slip and slide right there. Oh, dude, that looked like Crocodile Mile. Did you see Nick Bosa hitting that thing? Am I the only one old (laughs) enough to remember that? (laughs) (laughs) I really like the Trey Quinn catch on the sideline where it looked like he tried to make a cut and his feet just came out from underneath him and he slid (laughs) all the way off the field. (laughs) There was so much water, too. He hits and it's like the water almost goes over him. (laughs) Oh, gosh, it was awful. All right, Joe, you're up next. You won this week. So uh, explain a little bit about how your lineup finally carried you to victory. I followed the same process I've been following for weeks and weeks, and it finally hit. Gardner Minshew was great. Yeah, yeah. I miss you. Josh Jacobs, great. Dalvin Cook was awesome. Second highest scorer on the slate, I think. Maybe third at the running back position. Ted Ginn was just okay, but honestly, this lineup could have been a lot better because he basically dropped a touchdown. So that was a solid 10 points that this lineup was missing because of that one play. Tyler Lockett is Tyler Lockett. I think we can, I think now we can almost just pencil him in, can't we? I, not for DFS, the pricing is going to matter, but he looks like a guy that you just absolutely can't take out of your lineup, right? Yeah, you can't take him out right now. I mean, I and I have not been a Lockett apologist, and I haven't been a guy that's been really in his camp. I kind of thought he was, you know, really overrated in the preseason. But man, he just keeps making enough plays to be relevant. You have to have him plugged in at a minimum as your wide receiver too. Yeah, if you have him as your wide receiver too, you're really happy. If you have like a DeAndre Hopkins and him, you're really excited about your prospects going forward. Yeah, I actually have D Hop in one league, and a guy actually offered me Lockett and Miles Sanders. He was trying because D hop hadn't performed or done anything yet. And so he's like, well, I'll give you a locket. I was like, eh, I don't know. Well, I think I, I wasn't <laughs> able to pull the trigger on that just yet. Uh, I think I would have done it. Yeah. I, it's a keeper league and uh, Hopkins has a, a 10th round keeper value. And Woo. yeah, so I couldn't really give that up. Just to round this thing out. Cooper cup was a little bit of a disappointment. 11 points. I really don't know what to do with him going forward. He seems like, Him and that offense are really hard to predict. Hunter Henry was a smash. This is the last time we'll have him on cheap dates probably forever. Leonard Fournette, 19.5. Good, not great, 2.79x. And then that the Saints defense, man, the Saints defense had like 18 points with three minutes remaining in that game, and the garbage time dropped him down to 10. There was opportunity for this lineup to score 20 or 30 more points than it did. Yeah, it's kind of like they they took their foot off the gas defensively a little bit. And And with two onside kicks inside of three minutes, like, come on. Yeah, that was a lot. But the Cooper Cup thing, I don't know if we have to start kind of predicting him the same way we do golf. Like, are we measuring the golf lineup and the golf matchup and just saying, okay, it's going to be a cup week or not a cup week? Maybe. I think that teams are adjusting because it seems like Brandon Cooks isn't beating people one-on-one like he used to. Or maybe Goff just can't get him the football downfield like he used to because of the struggles on the it. offensive line. But they're not giving nearly as much attention to the speedster on the outside, and I think that's hurting everyone over the middle. Like, Gerald Everett has been really good, but I think that's going to change soon, too. I think yeah. he's going to be solid. He's still going to get the targets. He's still going to be a good PPR asset. But it seems like the ceiling for all of these players is limited by that offensive line and the quarterback play. Absolutely. Well, it, and they have the opposite problem with the backup. If they happen to pull Goff or if Goff goes down, you've got Bortles. I mean, he can hit Cooks deep. He's got the gun for that, but he can't hit anything short of that. Yeah. So a couple evaporate, Everett will evaporate Gurley. I mean, for what he's getting would evaporate. 
And uh, so it's a really uh, it's, a, it's a tough fantasy spot to be in right now with that O-line being in tatters. All right, guys. And then there's me, the uh, consistent silver medal. I didn't have a bad week. Um, I'm looking at this lineup and I'm kind of impressed with some of my calls. Andy Dalton. I was worried about that one, but 21.3 points despite throwing three interceptions at the end of the game. I'm okay with that. And Tyler Boyd wasn't good. It, that was such a weird week in that game for those offensive weapons. Like Auden Tate was okay. There really weren't any offensive weapons that were like blow you off the map. Uh, and it all was solid. Well, Erickson, Erickson was, was good. really good. Who plays Erickson? <laughs> I don't know. I didn't. I feel like I should have now. This was the hindsight. weirdest week. There, there were lineups that were entirely top 10 assets this week that scored like 50 points and also lineups that were all unowned players that scored tons of points you know i saw a little something on the twitter verse today that you guys might just appreciate this was actually from scott barrett yeah i read that too that's what i'm talking about yeah okay so yeah team a i just want to put this out there for everybody matt ryan david johnson carry on johnson will fuller tyler boyd evan ingram total 16.8 ppr points team b jacoby Brissett, chase edmonds lap murray marvin jones zach pascal rhett ellison 177.8 177.8 PPR points. How That's would you, crazy. How would you feel in your season-long league losing to that lineup with if you had Team A and you lost to Team B? Would you just quit fantasy football? Like, do you just give up? No, I just <laughs> stopped paying attention by the second quarter of the first game and <laughs> start chalked drinking. it up as a loss and walked away. I probably We're on to Cincinnati. Drinking. I would have Belichicked it. We're on yeah. to Cincinnati. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Good call. All right, back to my lineup. Uh, Lashamoko is my chief debt running back. Not awful, but not great. 9.6 points. I mean, I think he was the better running back on the field that game, which is not saying a lot, I guess, at nine points. Leonard Fournette, we already talked about 19.5. Mohamed Sanu crapped the bed for me, but Matt Ryan getting hurt didn't help that at all. It was later in the game, but 1.3 points, not doing it for me. DeAndre Hopkins, we've already talked about. John Brown, 19.3 points. I said it to Joe in the pre-show. My weak MVP, just because I had him everywhere, and... This was a game that he was expected to get at least 15 plus, and he did it. So thanks, John Brown. Gerald Everett, 15 points. Golden Tate, 14. And the Texans defense, two. Again, the silver medal. I'm okay with that. At least I'm not losing. Yeah, this is a solid lineup. It wouldn't hit the cash in any tournaments. But if you put this in your cash lineup, it would have been a risky cash lineup. But you probably would have hit. In most 50-50s, I would have seen. You almost doubled me off this week. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Just saying, sometimes silver isn't all bad. No, it's great. Again, at least they never lose. You shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> booth review. All right, guys, time for the booth reviews. We're going to look at our what to watch for us from last week. Joe, kick us off. I was watching the Bills fill-ins. Like you mentioned, John Brown, fringe wide receiver one, 19.3 points. Josh Allen was a fringe QB one. That was a little bit disappointing, but he got me by in a few spots. Beasley was a solid flex at 10.6. The running backs were super disappointing. Luckily, I only had one share in my lineups this week. Singletary is baffling. His snap share is okay. His usage is pretty low. He needs those big plays to get you by. I don't think that there's a world where I'm going to be playing Singletary unless he breaks out going forward, but he's a guy that I'm still stashing, and I'm I'm excited about him in Dynasty. I got a fun story for uh, for you involving this game. I was uh, sitting with my best friend Tucker. We were watching the uh, Cole Beasley touchdown. I turned to him and I make the worst joke ever. I just go, man, Miami Dolphins must not have gotten their vaccinations because they caught the Beasles. My wife just turns and gives me this cold stare (laughs) of this. I can't even believe you just made that damn joke. That's probably the weirdest moment of the morning. Jeff's rubbing off on you. I've been trying to get you on the dad joke train for like three years, Murph. And it only took like a oh, month and a half of Jeff to really get you on board. I'm kind I'm of infectious about that. I'm infectious, man. What can I say? <laughs> oh my God. You better get that checked out. Yeah. But <laughs> they make, I'm sure they make some kind of topical cream for that thing. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh I got the Beasles too, though, man. I do have the Beasles. Oh man. I actually ran them in a couple lineups this week. And, uh, if I wouldn't have, you know, closed my DraftKings window at 2 45 PM on Sunday, because well, everything seemed to be going sideways. I'd actually get to see how he finished, but, uh, you know, I guess I'm going to take, it says 10.6. Is that what he actually got in DraftKings? Yep. Perfect. That's the only thing I know about my lineups right now. <laughs> You're afraid to look at it. <laughs> oh yeah. I don't want to know. I mean, I didn't spend a ton of money, but I'm sure I didn't win anything or get any of it back. 
All right, Jeff, you're up next. What was your first what to watch for from last week? You know, I had the Texans Colts game. This for me was a de facto playoff game. The winner here was basically going to set the tone for that division. The Jaguars, I just don't know if they're really going to be competing on the highest level without Jalen Ramsey defensively because they've definitely shown some signs of wear. But man, how about the Colts? You know, this is a close game and they won it the way they probably should have won. It was close. But Jacoby Brissett comes out 326 and four. He looks like the real deal. This guy, he's doing everything he can to replace, quote, replace Andrew Luck. He's playing up to the standard. I mean, this is a guy that we can be talking about as a low end QB one in a couple of weeks. He's already hovering in that kind of 15 to 17 category with a difference of about one to maybe two points a week from the guys in the, you know, eight through 12 slots. That's a big deal. I think that he's going to be a guy that should be targeted if he's not already owned in your leagues and uh, and stashed out as we move forward, especially if you're getting hit with injuries or bye weeks, et cetera. But uh, man, Zach Pascal's become like a relevant player. You're still getting some love at a T.Y. Hilton, Eric Ebron with another goal line look, you know. It's a really, really interesting group, and I'm very excited about the direction of the Colts right now. I heard somebody on the four-letter network say that Jacoby Brissett is the best quarterback in the AFC right now. Let's pump the brakes. Yeah, serious brake pumping. Like, if if you're counting Mahomes as not being in the AFC because he can't play right now, he's still not the best quarterback in the AFC. He's probably not actually the best quarterback in his own division because of Deshaun Watson. That's but what he's I'm saying. playing at a very high level right now, and that should be recognized. I, I think we have to consider the fact that he's putting up these kinds of numbers where he's going north of 300 and he's getting you two, three, four touchdowns in a week. And that's enough if you're going for a bye week filler or if you're filling in for an injury to sustain your team. When you're talking about being a one point differential from the guys that are your quote QB ones. He's an absolutely streamable asset and absolutely a guy you need to have on your radar if you don't have a quarterback currently. He's Andy Dalton when Andy Dalton had an offensive line. Uh, I might go a little better than Andy Dalton. Andy Dalton was QB4 when he had an offensive line. He was, but a lot of that was A.J. Green because A.J. Green was also healthy. So T.Y. Hilton is not comparable to A.J. Green? Different types of receiver. Totally, but I think that they make a similar difference in the game. Uh, yeah, I, I guess. I don't know, man. I look at a guy like Zach Pascal as being like, who the hell is Zach Pascal? Like, get out of here. Come on now. As the second, you know, kind of weapon in that offense or the second receiver. Heck, he was their number one receiver this week. Like, it takes a different type of quarterback to make that guy useful. And I don't know that Andy Dalton would have done exactly that. I mean, yeah, I guess he made Erickson useful this week. I don't know. I just, I, it just feels dirty to me to put him in the same group because I think I just like Brissett better. He's making Alden Tate good, too. I think you need to give Andy Dalton a little bit more credit. I mean, yeah, you're probably right. And I'm probably being unfair to Andy. Everyone hates Andy Dalton, and I think that probably sounded like a slight to a lot of people. But I'm not saying that as a slight to Andy Dalton. I think he's a good quarterback. Yeah, and I think for me, is it's Andy Dalton is just a, I don't know. I, I don't know what it is about him. He just, he wins. He's just, he's a good quarterback. He can win. He's fine. I just, I just don't love him. I don't know. I, I don't know. Sorry, I don't have a good... I have nothing there except for I just like Brissett better than Dalton. Jeff hates gingers. It's fine. It's, <laughs> I mean, I I mean, I dated the ginger once, so I mean, you can't say I completely hate them, but... I, <laughs> they are soulless creatures. I know. I found out. <laughs> I mean, I'm married to one, so I can say I'm an expert on, the, on this uh, oh, subject. Man. I'm glad your wife doesn't like football, because... I know. Oof. Earmuffs. You'd be in trouble there. <laughs> Before we move on, can we talk about that Eric Ebron catch? You guys know the one I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. One of the best catches of the year. D- did you see his interview when he was talking about it after the, I think it might have been with NFL Network or somebody. Um, He just looked like the happiest guy on earth. He made I that caught catch. it. I caught it. Well, yeah. Well, he, <laughs> he caught it and just like all smiles. He was just so happy. Like he just looked like he was thrilled to have somebody talking to him about the catch. Cause apparently he actually told the back judge when he made the catch and the, they initially tried to rule it. It wasn't a catch. He says, Hey, you got that wrong. I got both my feet down. You're going to need to review that. Nice. And, uh, and I love that. Uh, I just love when a receiver or tight end back, whoever has that confidence where they're just like, nah, man, you, you messed up. Go ahead and go fix that. <laughs> I just thought that was great. Can you blame him for the excitement though? All those years in Detroit and he can finally now let it loose. I mean, there is a podcast that calls him murder holes because of how many passes he drops. So, (laughs) yeah, it's got to feel nice to make a catch like that. Well, now let's not get too crazy because he does still have a handful of drops on the year. He's got four drops still this year. And his drops are outpacing his. 
He did last right. year too. Yeah, and that's just kind of a peril of having Eric Ebron. And he's going to make some big plays near the near the goal line. He'll make some big plays in the end zone. And that's what you're picking him up for. You're never going to pick him up and let him be like a Kelsey type guy where he can get 10 targets, seven catches, 100 yards. Like He's just not going to be that guy. He'll be six catches, two of them for touchdowns and 40 yards. And it'll be a hell of a day and you're going to love it. He did that last year for like 15 weeks. All right, guys, we're up to me. And I, my first game was that Vikings game. I wanted to see if that offense could keep putting the pedal to the floor. And yes, yes, they could. Cousins, 337 yards, four touchdowns, zero picks, 29.1 points. Uh, Dalvin Cook, 142 yards and one touchdown. I mean, Dalvin Cook is Dalvin Cook. I, I really have nothing else to say on that matter. Diggs, seven for 142. Thielen got hurt. Is going to miss, what, two or three weeks, I do believe is what I saw. But regardless, this offense looks fantastic. And I'm just happy for him after the start of that season. I'm, I'm happy to see Cousins riding the ship because I would hate to watch Minnesota just shove all that money down the drain for an entire season. Well, now, Murph, I got to just let you know, they've got a Thursday night game coming this week, and there's going to be a little bit of a downtick. I mean, yeah, it's fine. I'm not going to play any of them myself. but yeah. They're going to beat Washington, but it's not going to be as pretty as people would want it to be. And I wouldn't be shocked if this is one of those games where like Cousins has like one touchdown and two picks, but they still win because Dalvin Cook goes bananas. Just because he's a creature of habit and he needs to be in that one o'clock time slot. Go check his splits in the one o'clock games versus any other time slot. Kirk Cousins, man, he loves one o'clock. He is awful in every other time slot. This is what Kirk Cousins does too. Like he smashes and smashes and smashes and then poops for like a month. <laughs> Well, yeah, and a lot of those early games, like when he was pooping earlier this month, or earlier, I guess, last month, rather, there was primetime games. He had a Sunday night game. They had a Thursday game. They had like a 4 o'clock game. They were all over the place. They went ahead and they got a couple 1 o'clock games in a row, softer opponents, and he just comes out firing. And and it was like that in Washington, too. You could just count on it like clockwork. He's a 1 o'clock game quarterback. I don't know why. I don't know what it is. Something in his meal plan or his sleep schedule just <laughs> lends itself to playing at 1 o'clock. I don't know why, but when you guys were talking about uh, him pooping for a month, I just immediately got like a variation of that Baker Mayfield commercial where he's pretending the Brown Stadium is home. And you just got Kirk Cousins sitting on the 30 yard line, somebody driving by in a mower. Hey, Jim, just sitting there with the newspaper, just taking a poo. <laughs> that was, except for he was pooping all over the sheets, the bed, the field, and everything else. <laughs> I also want him to be screaming in this uh, this <laughs> metaphor. You like that? <laughs> you like that? <laughs> <laughs> like at, oh, at the dry cleaner with the sheets. You like that? They're like, no, I don't <laughs> like that. <laughs> We're charging you extra, Mr. Cousins. <laughs> it's okay. I can afford it. It was all guaranteed. <laughs> Sir, this is a Wendy's. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jeff, we're back to you. What was your second what to watch for? You know, it wasn't actually one of the head-to-head -head games that were happening, but it was watching the combination of the Bengals in one game and the Dolphins in the other game to see who can finish the race to the bottom. Both teams lost again. The race for Tua is on. So, And I do believe that the Bengals pick first, that it won't be Andy Dalton's show anymore. They're going to have to go with Tua or some other quarterback there. These two teams are still over, but here's the thing. They go head-to-head -head in Week 16. And looking ahead at their schedules, it's totally plausible that both teams are over for that game. The Tua Bowl could be in week 16. Mark it down. I got a hot take for you right now, Jeff. Oh, and Joe's going to drop his jaw right here. I think we should get rid of the moniker tank for Tua. I don't think he's the quarterback you want to tank for. Woo! Woo! Oh, tell me more. Now, do I think he's a great quarterback? Yes. I'm not trying to sit here and and talk bad about him, but... If I'm a Miami Dolphins fan, I don't want Tua to go to a franchise where the offensive line is absolute garbage and he has all these lower leg problems behind a good offensive line in college. That's just a recipe for disaster, and I think it could hurt his career. So personally, I want to see him drop to say like the 10th or later pick. Hell, I'd like for him to be the third quarterback off the board. I think he could smash. He's he seen that in the past couple of years. Bionic ankle joints now, though. I mean, what about the rest of the leg? <laughs> Can we get like Has a $6 million dollar man drop there? Can we, <laughs> <laughs> we can make, we can build him. We can make him stronger. Like, is that, that what's happening with Tua? Go, 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 go. Yeah. <laughs> to answer your question, Joe, what about the rest of the leg? You do remember that at the Heisman ceremony last year, he actually was uh, walking around for most of it with one of those like little scooters with his leg propped up in the air. Actually, I so. hate college football, so I didn't pay attention to that at all. News to Aww. me. Well, 
I'm going to keep you informed. It's all okay, right. Well, thanks. Well, now, wait a second. I, I want to take this one step further. So you're saying that two is not the guy. Who is? Who are they tanking for? What quarterback? Because we know Chase Young should be the top player in the draft because he's incredible. But what quarterback would you tank for if you're one of these two needy franchises? TBD. I really like a lot of the other quarterbacks that are coming in this draft class, but I want to see the rest of the season play out. I want to see injuries and I want to see the combine. This year is a year where you could see, I believe, four or five quarterbacks taken in the first three rounds. But I don't know which order they're going to go in yet. There's such a good disparity for in different ways for all of them. So I think we might see another year where we have like a Watson Mahomes, you know, thing where you're seeing three quarterbacks go off the board before pick 10. So it, it, it really just depends to be determined. I'm not going to say Jalen. I want to, but that's, that's the gut in me and it's, it's wrong. What did you call <laughs> my answer last week, Jeff? Like flaccid or something. The that was a flaccid sem- response. You're <laughs> right. It was se- semi flaccid. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> that fits that category. Well, that. oh yeah. I was like, man, we have a new, uh, new, new stake to the semi flaccid crowd. Semi flaccid take of the week. I'm getting a drop <laughs> made. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But that's my hot take. Bama oh. fan says don't tank for Tua. Tank for somebody else. Semi flaccid take of the week. <laughs> I was just about to do that. <laughs> semi flaccid take of the week. All right, guys, let's move into my second what to watch for. It was the Cowboys and the Eagles game. And I was really just wondering if the Cowboys could pull out a win, if hashtag fire Garrett was going to be on Twitter. And they did. My question to you guys is, are the Eagles still a good football team? Or has that defense got enough holes that they're not going to be a contender this year? Like wild card contender. The offensive line issues really seem like the bigger problem to me. They're not getting protection like they have in past years. And Carson Wentz looks bad under pressure. He's getting hit often. At some point during that game, they said there was a 50% pressure rate. That is atrocious. Like league average is like a quarter and you're like doubling that. I think it's really, really a rough situation for that team on both sides of the football. Yeah, I, man, the Eagles just don't look that good in general. I was really hoping for more for Miles Sanders. That offensive line should be better than they are and they're not. I don't know why they're so out of sync. You know, there was a point in the the beginning of that football game where I want to say they had, what was it? Th- was it 13 carries and, and only like six pass plays or something like that? That was like a really weird disparity, but Doug Peterson's not mixing up his play calling anymore. He's he's getting a little, a little predictable, I guess. And I'm thinking maybe the rest of the league, especially some elite coordinators are going to catch up to him, you know, and the Cowboys have some talent defensively now. So let's not sell them short. But man, the Eagles need to do something quick. And I don't know if Howie Roseman's got something up his sleeve to get them some help, but they, they need a shot in the arm pretty quickly. Is it just me, though? Or weren't we saying this exact same thing last year and they ended up being a pretty darn good football team? Like, this seems like we just did this last year. I mean, maybe. It, I try not to compare too heavily, like year after year after year, when I have to sit here and say, oh, well, they do this every year. It's every year your team is completely different, right? You have new rookies you have new guys that have learned new things about the offense you have new coaches you have new rhythms everything's new in any given season so it's kind of hard to compare year to year but the team does seem flat something's missing i don't know what it is maybe it's the offensive line isn't clicking so you know you know carson's not quite right which is messing up everybody else you know maybe the defense is so bad the offense feels too much pressure to perform there could be any number of things that are impacting them right now but right they don't look good in any of the three phases they look pretty awful across the board. So like I said, whether it's Peterson, Roseman, somebody needs to do something to, to wake these guys up because if they play the way they played against Dallas, they ain't making it to the playoffs. For, forget one and done. They won't even be there. All right, Joe, we're going to end it with you. What was your last what to watch for for the week? My last what to watch for was that Seahawks offense and specifically the Pass catchers, Tyler Lockett, DK Metcalf, whether or not they could be consistent. Lockett, we already talked about. He looks like he could really be very consistent. He was getting more work again with Will Disley out. Metcalf, he's getting the volume, man. Like he had 108 air yards, scored only 8.3 fantasy points on him. He had nine targets. That was a season high. You've really got to start to worry about maybe his chemistry with Russell Wilson or just his ability to catch contested balls because he's not a guy that's going to get a ton of separation in the short field based on his route running abilities. And you've got to catch the ones downfield if you're not going to be a good route runner in the short field. 
Yeah, I think they're almost using him as a decoy. When they're sending him deep, they're doing so on purpose. They're just trying to keep the safeties back. I don't know that they're really using him with intent yet. And they've targeted him in the end zone a few times, and they're targeting him downfield. And he does have the air yards. But I really want to see them do a better job of scheming him open. You know, last week we saw it a little bit more where they got that crossing concept set up where they ended up finding him in the end zone or near the end zone. Rather, he took it in for the score. And uh, those are the player or the plays rather in the schemes that we need to see for DK to be really useful in this offense. The takeaway. All right. So with our what to watch for is out of the way. It's time for the takeaway. Our other takeaways from the week that are outside of what we were actually watching. Joe, I'm going to start with you. What was your takeaway from the week? I think I'm a buyer on Tyler Boyd. We're talking about a guy that's still getting a massive volume share. He's not catching a ton of targets, so he's pooped the bed in the last couple of weeks. I guarantee you, you've got a Tyler Boyd owner in a league near you that's panicking. I think he's a good football player. I think as long as Andy Dalton is the quarterback, which there is some question about, like with a team that bad, you might want to see what you have in, what's his name, Ryan Finley? Yeah, the kid from NC State. Yeah. So, you know, like, I'm still a buyer on Tyler Boyd. There is some risk there, but I think you could get him for cheap. And if A.J. Green comes back, all of a sudden Tyler Boyd isn't getting all this defensive attention after the bye week, and they have some pretty nice matchups coming up. So I think I would go out, I would buy Tyler Boyd. Remember, like, this is the same segment I told you to sell Mark Ingram in, and as far as being predictable goes, that was a pretty decent call. Yeah, if Mark Ingram's not getting touchdowns, that was an easy call. And Tyler Boyd, I mean, he's going to get more looks when A.J. Green comes back. I think you're spot on with this, but I don't know if Finley's going to get any looks. I think it's going to be the Andy Dalton show until he proves he just can't play. Yeah, I agree. I think we're going to continue to see him, but there is a little concern there, which you can sell to the Tyler Boyd owner. Like, oh, do we even know who the quarterback's going to (laughs) be? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I can see that. All right, Jeff, over to you. What is your takeaway from the week? You know, I'm starting to watch the playoffs take shape. So this helps me identify what offenses I want a piece of moving into trade deadlines and and moving into fantasy playoffs. What I'm looking for right now is teams like Green Bay, teams like Indianapolis. A, A few of these squads really need a deeper look. And if you're in a position where you can buy up a guy like Marlon Mack kind of cheap, who's, you know, he only had 44 yards, but on 18 carries. The Colts only have three games of their remaining 10 against teams with a winning record. Marlon Mack is going to get plenty of volume and volume is king moving forward. I'd want to have him, even if he's my running back three, as just an insurance stash. Somebody's going to sell him cheap right now. I'd probably go get him. It's an offense I want to be involved with. Green Bay is another situation where you might go buy up a couple of the pass catchers. Devontae Adams, go buy Devontae Adams while people are panicking because they're two and five because their first round pick didn't succeed. That's actually a great one. Yeah, Devontae Adams is one. You know, I'm not even afraid to go get the wide receiver two, like a, you know, uh, MVS. Give me some Marquez Valdez Scantling. Is that MVS? Yeah. Huh. Do you think that he only played 30% of the snaps because of the injury? Yeah, I think they were scaling him back a little bit. And that's why we saw a lot of Kumaro. And that's why we saw still more of the Lazard King. And we we saw plenty of other players there and I don't know that he's going to see a full snap load for probably two more weeks. I think they can kind of ease him back in because his big asset to them is his speed that we were talking about a four, three, seven guy and they need his wheels. So Allison is another guy worth having, but if you're talking about a two, it's a two and a two a one's the deep threat and one's a slot guy. You can kind of pick your poison and, and decide which way you want to go. I like MVS cause I love his speed and his ability to get deep. And also, so he, he's not a terrible receiver. Geronimo Allison is a terrible receiver. Yeah, he's Dr- a bad Drummer's route not runner. Really, he has a ton of drops. He's terrible. Yeah, I'll take the touchdown upside with MVS. I just think he's that guy that he's a touchdown waiting to happen at any given moment. I, I think that's my big takeaway is getting involved in some of these offenses on the teams that have established themselves as being legitimate playoff contenders. I still can't believe somebody dropped Aaron Rodgers in my hometown league. Talk about panicking hard. <laughs> we, we talked about <laughs> this. Thanks for the free QB1. Hey, Thanks, you, Ben. Well, do you guys remember a few weeks back, we talked about Aaron Rodgers potentially being available by week seven, week eight on your waiver wire because he was, you know, he wasn't playing well. He wasn't putting up fantasy numbers. He was quarterback 14, 15, 16. You know, people weren't going to just stand on that while their season was going to heck in a handbag. So it's not really that surprising, but this big, like, you know, 50 point bomb, he just dropped on everybody. Certainly, uh, 
woke some people up and shocked them back into reality. Nobody saw that coming either. Like I actually yeah, had some trouble with, do I start Gardner Minshew or Aaron Rodgers this week because of the pass catchers being out right. for Green Bay. Right. I mean, I didn't play any Aaron Rodgers in DFS and well, I mean, I had to close the app and close the DK <laughs> window on my computer at 2 45 PM. So Eastern standard time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, I got a couple takeaways. First of all, if you've already played against Lamar Jackson, you know this, but if going forward, you have Lamar Jackson on your opponent's team, go ahead and buy a bottle of something stiff to keep next to you in the chair when watching football, because that is absolutely a terrifying feeling. I played against Lamar Jackson in two leagues this week, and I was sitting on the edge of my seat the entire time. And every run he broke, I was just like, oh, Christ. You need shots for that. It's scary, man. I think he has the highest floor and maybe the highest ceiling of any quarterback in football right now. And that's easily it's crazy because he's not a great passer. So you'd think that that ceiling would be a little lower, but he can run for 160 and throw for 100 and run for two and throw for two in any game. Right. If they are in the red zone, he is a scrambling threat for a 15 to 20 yard touchdown every time. And it's everyone's fun. open because of it. Like it's a crazy cheat code. Yeah. The fact that they design so many run plays for him. His carries aren't just, oh, I ran because I needed to. It's, no, these are designed runs. He's running because they schemed it up for him to get into the open field and use his greatest asset, which is his legs. I've got Lamar Jackson in a few spots. I grabbed him in Dynasty as a rookie, and I've been sitting on him, and I've been thrilled with the results. So, yeah, I hope that the people who are playing against me are drinking heavily because I really want them to make trades with me immediately after those games. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, my second takeaway is the, the Mitch Trubisky experiment is probably over at this point, and I wonder how long it's going to take for Chicago to actually start making moves with that in mind. Mitch Bortles. He's Mitch Bortles. Come on. Let's get it right now. Yeah, he, he looks exactly like Blake Bortles out there, and and I feel bad for Allen Robinson. I don't. He, he screwed <laughs> me this week. I don't feel bad at all. He's still scoring like 20 points, even with a terrible quarterback. Dude, could you imagine Allen Robinson with a great quarterback? Like, just imagine Allen Robinson for a moment with, like, Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady. Like, I just imagine this place, this alternate reality where Allen Robinson can go and get open and actually have a ball thrown on target, and he can go run for touchdowns after the catch. It's just this magical, mystical place that I think is actually run by unicorns. To have Blake Bortles South immediately followed by Blake Bortles North is just painful. Jeff putting the fantasy in fantasy football. Oh, super fantasy. <laughs> Tapping the wire. All right, time to tap the wire. Looking at those waiver wires. Jeff, you did the honors of the waiver wire list for me this week. I, I fell asleep right after work and I was kind of embarrassed about that. But the only quarterback you have listed is Sam Darnold, even after this game, because he does not look good tonight. To be fair, I started this list before <laughs> this game. <laughs> uh, here's the thing 25% owned. More and more quarterbacks are getting hurt every week. You know, we don't really know what the status of guys like Mahomes long term, Matt Ryan, and you already had a few guys hurt. Bye weeks are starting to really take effect. He's got great matchups coming up. Yeah, New England's tough. We know that they're the worst matchup for fantasy quarterbacks. But here's Darnold's upcoming schedule for the remainder of the season at Jacksonville, at Miami, Giants at home, at Washington, Oakland at home, at Cincinnati, Miami at home, at Baltimore, Pittsburgh. It's mostly cake. Seven games are considered top 15 matchups for quarterbacks. That really puts Darnold in a great place to win. This is the same guy where last year he didn't get hot until the back end of the season. I'm really looking forward to more of that with some of these cake matchups. If you got to plug him in for a week here, a week there, or heck, even a two or three week stretch, he might be a guy worth grabbing and, and sticking on your bench for right now. It's Sam Darnold, Robbie Anderson season going forward. I mean, I'm hoping for a little, little Chris Herndon, maybe a little, little, I like Chris Herndon. I hope he gets on the field soon. Yeah, it's, uh, well, next week, right? Right? Fingers crossed, maybe. Let's hope. And is Le'Veon Bell a buy-low target? Like, I'm looking at his stat line right now going, eh, and I think you might be able to get him cheaper than most people would have paid a week or two ago right now. Are you guys buying on him? Yeah, I'd buy him. Yeah, I called him a buy-low candidate a couple of weeks ago. I'd do it again. Yeah, I mean, and I like Lev Bell. I think he has the skills, and he's getting the opportunity in terms of the touches compared to the number of plays run by the Jets, which they don't run enough plays, but at least he's still seeing a ton of work. It's not like they're phasing him out the way the Bengals have basically done to Joe Mixon. All right, moving on to running backs. We've got Chase Edmonds, the kind of obvious pick. 
Ty Johnson and Alexander Madison. Chase Edmonds, I don't know how valuable he's going to be, but he looked great spelling David Johnson. David Johnson is obviously going through some serious injury stuff right now. He played a few snaps and he looked really ginger on that ankle. I, I don't know if this is a long-term play, but Edmonds looks good and he's he's still way under owned. Yeah, and we did bring him up, what, two weeks ago? We talked about he's actually probably a better scheme fit right now than David Johnson in that running back spot. He just seems to be more explosive. He's getting more done in the offense. Uh, I love Chase Edmonds if you can grab him if he's not already snatched up. And I don't know if he was spelling David Johnson as much as he was spelling touchdown over and over and over again. <laughs> just winning the spelling bee with touchdowns. Uh, you know, the next guy, Ty Johnson, carry on looks like he's going to miss some time. So he he's banged up again. Another, I believe it was a knee, right? Yep. Yeah. So he's down with another knee. He's expected to miss a few weeks. You know, I'm looking at Ty Johnson as a guy who can step in and put up some yards, but this is going to be a committee situation in Detroit. They're not a particularly great football team, but if you're desperate for a running back, you can probably get Ty Johnson seriously cheap from a fab standpoint, or he's probably going to clear waivers. You might be able to get him as a free agent in your, in your league. Uh, Alexander Madison, 21% owned. Hey, Dal Cook owners, you see what your boy's doing. If he's healthy through the playoffs, you're golden. But as you get geared up for the playoffs, it doesn't hurt to cut some dead weight off your bench and make sure you have your own handcuff. You don't need him all year, but you do need him down the stretch for your playoffs because if something happens in week 14, you're going to be pissed because there's no one left to pick up. Oddly enough, in that committee situation, it's it's certainly because there are fewer bodies with on Johnson out, but Ty Johnson played 64% of the snaps this week. So that's a right. big number. It's a, it's a really big number for a guy that's basically stepping in late draft. He was a late draft pick or was he a free agent UDFA? I remember that he had all the measurables and he's fast and all that. I just can't remember exactly how they came to acquire him. Undrafted. Boom. That's not bad for a UDFA. And again, if you can grab a guy that's going to be getting north of 50% of those carries, give them to me at this point in the year, especially if you just lost carry on. All right, Joe, any low owned guys? Mark Walton. Led Miami in snaps at the running back position. He's only 12.4% owned. That offense looks like it might be marginally better with Ryan Fitzpatrick than it was with Josh Rosen. I still wouldn't throw him out there, but he's a guy that you can maybe stash on your bench in a deeper league. And then Benny Snell, we mentioned him last week. He played half of the snaps in week six. He's still out there in a ton of leagues coming off the bye. So worth a shot. We don't really know when that backfield gets healthy again, but for now, Snell is a decent pickup. All right, then moving into wide receivers, we got Kenny Stills with Will Fuller going to miss a few weeks with that hamstring injury. Corey Davis, as we already talked about earlier, and Preston Williams slash Devontae Parker, pretty much garbage time Miami points. Yeah, both of them have actually been putting up pretty decent numbers lately, and they're owned in almost no league. So I actually like Preston Williams and Devontae Parker as break glass in case of emergency kind of plays. Corey Davis is a guy that I'm really trying to acquire right now. Of course you are. Corey Davis season <laughs> upon us. Finally. I mean, if it's Corey Davis season, then we're basically saying it's almost Ryan or yeah. Ryan Tannehill season. Let's not get crazy. Oh, here, I know. Jeff. Well, I'm Come just on. I know. Well, I mean, I haven't even started drinking yet. And I was just making sure that that's what I was hearing. A wide receiver can easily score you 20 points in a game where the quarterback gets you 12. Well, I mean, yeah, that's the story of Ryan Tannehill's dolphins experience. You know, Jarvis yeah. Landry got a ton of points and then Tannehill didn't do very much. But I mean, Davis and, you know, Brown and, you know, a- Adam Humphreys. Huh? Anybody? Nobody? <laughs> Not really. AJ uh, Brown looked more involved than Adam Humphreys with Tannehill at the helm. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. I, I love the Corey Davis pick there. I really think Kenny Stills is going to be a monster with Fuller out. And uh, yeah, I mean, you're, you, you hit on all of them right here that I had any kind of uh, interest in at this point in the season. All right, Joe, what's there at the bottom of the barrel if you're scraping? This is a very occupied bottom of the barrel this week. Dante Pettis scored zero points, so he's even getting dropped everywhere, 90-plus percent of the snaps for the first time this year. I'm giving him a mulligan on that game. Like, it was a monsoon. Anthony Miller, 74% of the snaps and nine targets in Week 7. He's owned in 12.9% of leagues. Danny Amendola, 71% of the snaps, 11 targets, 6.1% owned. This is an interesting one. Ola B.C. Johnson. If Adam Thielen misses serious time, 
He played in 71.2% of the snaps. He got eight targets. I don't think he's a great play by any means, but if, if Thielen's out, he could be getting quite a bit of work. And then Antonio Callaway and Demarius Thomas, we mentioned both of those guys last week. I think they're both decent stashes too. None of these guys are throw them in your lineup kind of guys. They're the kind of guys that you cycle onto your roster when you can put a guy on your IR, for example. You know, that that's the kind of play these are. Don't put them in your lineup yet. All right, and finally, tight ends. We got a couple names here. Chris Herndon, Dawson Knox, and Janu Smith. All pretty solid options. Yeah, I mean, I actually have the group kind of like Jonu Smith. Another guy that might be free this week, especially if you're dealing with, you know, tight ends on bye weeks or injuries, etc. You know, Delaney Walker goes down. Jonu Smith steps right in. And I'm not saying Tannehill's going to be thrown around to everybody, but somebody's got to get some looks and you have to feel the tight end. He might be nice uh, one to two week flyer if you really need him. We've talked about guys like Herndon and Knox pretty much ad nauseum in the last few weeks. I don't think we need to talk anymore about that. But uh, John o. Smith might be an interesting guy that is almost assuredly to be available. Only uh, owned in 0.1% of leagues. Yep. All right, Joe, you got any low owned tight ends out of curiosity? Uh, four of them actually what? this week. These aren't I'm, Dallas Coder, I think, is the one that I think you can throw him into your lineup with a little bit of confidence. He played this week. He played 36 snaps to Ertz's 49. He's not getting all that much attention from defenses. So, the red zone usage is there. The opportunity is there. I don't think he's a great play, but in deeper leagues, two tight end leagues, you can acquire him pretty easily. I think he's a good play. Josh Oliver coming back from injury could be big in that Jacksonville offense if they can get off the ground. Jacob Hollister. This is one that he's owned in 0.0% of leagues. He's out of Wyoming. It, this is not a great play, but... Seattle does like to use the tight end position. He had 515 yards on 32 receptions in 2016 at Wyoming. He's a player that if you're absolutely scraping the bottom of the barrel, he's a decent flyer. And we mentioned RSJ last week. He was on bye this week, so he didn't get a whole lot of buzz. 68% snap share in week six. So worth a shot if you're desperate. I really didn't think any of your low owned guys would get lower owned than my 0.1% Jonu Smith. Well I done. did it. Well I done. did it. I mean, that was, it was a low <laughs> bar and you dug a trench and army crawled through it underneath that bar. I'm proud of you. I'm actually, I'm very impressed right now. Ownership trench limbo. That's what we call this segment now. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to need a drop for that. Ownership trench limbo. I feel like we're getting a lot of good drop opportunities in this episode. Yeah. I'm going to have to go back and listen again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, that'll do it for the week seven review, man. I'm glad bye week hell's over because that's kind of what the last two weeks have been. And I feel like for the rest of the season, I'll be feeling better. It might only be over for you and I based on our roster construction because those bye weeks later on in the season, I think nine and 10 are just atrocious for a ton of people. I'm one of those people. Uh, I'm not looking forward to weeks nine and 10. You shut, you shut your mouth over there. Murphy. Well, I've already <laughs> gone through the pain. It's your turn. <laughs> it's always my turn. Except the last two weeks, Jeff. Come on. I know. It's not always uh, well, I mean, hard. okay. Well, I mean, I lost like George Kittle in week four. I mean, does that count? No. no. <laughs> it doesn't. Come on. I'm trying here, man. I'm just trying to be a part of the group. All right? Yeah. All right, guys. We'll be back on Thursday for our week eight preview. For Jeff at NFL underscore D Mateo. For Joe at Human Stat Sheet on Twitter. And of course, myself at Murphy FFT. Or find us all in the NFL Fantasy Football Discussion Group on Facebook. Stay classy, Takeaway Nation. Later. <laughs> if you're going to die on a hill, don't let it be the Ryan Tanny Hill. Oh, oh God. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Fantasy Takeaway Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And follow the show on Twitter at FF Takeaway. Yeah. You're the worst, Jeff. <laughs> I think I'm done making dad jokes now. I think you, uh, I think you broke it. <laughs> Dude, that was, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs>